Hey everybody, Phil here. Now, when it comes to the soundtracks of past relationships, you quickly realize that no matter what you want, you're never fully separated from your exes. There will always be something keeping you two together forever. The music. The music shared can never be unshared. And every time you hear that song, be it finally or otherwise, you think of that person. It all matters. The music, the ex, the good and the bad and the funny and the hard memories, it all still matters and it all still counts. And that's a good thing. With more, here's Mary Palazzotti, recorded live at Noise Pops Culture Club in 2012. So we shared French class and Shakespeare our senior year of boarding school. He had a really easy smile with Hugh Grant dimples and calming blue-green eyes. He was quiet and seemed a bit weird, but kind of in a good way. When I asked him to help me carry a couch up three flights of stairs to my dorm room, he willingly obliged, taking the top stance and gazing downward at my loose-fitting tank top to my newly developed D cups. We did the flirtation dance for many months and hooked up well after the rest of the world thought we had. It was a Saturday night in his dorm room. We hung out for hours listening to Tracy Chapman. It was the only CD in his collection with a name I recognized. He told me he liked my hair. It has so many different colors. Then we kissed. His roommate, a guy from Queens named Joe Lewis, began to call him Marathon, which implied that he and the rest of the school thought we were having insanely long sex sessions. In fact, the opposite was true. I took his virginity many months later. The long hangouts involved sitting around, listening to his eclectic music collection, 99% of which I'd never heard of. I had an obsession with Dave Matthews' band. I preferred rap, Snoop, Dr. Dre, and hip-hop, and my recent intro to pot smoking had solidified my wavering thoughts on the Grateful Dead. Guys, this is so cliche, but I finally get it. He liked Sonic Youth, Blonde Redhead, Sebado, and his all-time favorite, Fugazi. We agreed upon Nirvana and the Red Hot Chili Peppers and the Beastie Boys. Hey, I was not a total punk and metal Luddite. I knew all the words to Pearl Jam's 10, and I still do. He was a bass player in his hometown band. They called themselves Grey, and they had recorded a cassette tape, which I happily played in my wood-sided Jeep Grand Wagoneer, straining to hear his every move across the strings of his bass. The first time I went to his house, he guided me down to the basement filled with acoustic and electric guitars, a drum set, and speakers and wires galore. I sat on a speaker while he and his younger brother jammed away, and I grabbed a guitar and plucked away in an attempt to harmonize with their sound. Signing out from boarding school on the weekend meant escaping to the city, and Cambridge was our stomping ground. He loved guitars and explained at length to me why a Rickenbacker bass was the best. He idolized Ian Mackay of Fugazi and Lou Marlowe, the bassist for Sebado and formerly Dinosaur Jr. One day, we saw Lou Marlowe in the indie record store Stereo Jacks, and he was starstruck. The underground club The Middle East in Central Square became a familiar spot as he dragged me to one alternative lo-fi band after another. We spent a lot of time together browsing Newberry Comics. He in the alt-rock section, me in the classic rock, and embarrassingly enough, the top 40 section. I, like every girl, fantasized that my musician boyfriend would write a song for me, just me. But he was not like other boyfriends. He was not that lame, nor that cliche. Instead, he would sit with his acoustic guitar in a slight trance and pick away at whatever would come to him. He never took lessons. His skills were self-learned, and I watched mesmerized. I loved playing along with him. I obviously sucked compared to his natural ability, but... I was pretty musically inclined, and with his extra guitar, would play clumsily along with his advanced renditions. He taught me Nirvana's Come As You Are, and Pavement's Father to a Sister of a Thought, a beautiful set of easy chords, and even humored me by teaching me a complicated Dave Matthews band, Lie in Our Graves. One night after dinner out, he asked me to open the trunk of his car. Inside, there was an acoustic guitar in pristine condition. I know you love to play, he told me, and I like it when you play, and I want you to have your own. It was one of the best gifts I've ever received. Our courtship outlasted high school and proceeded through our very own summer of love. 
His birthday approached, and I spent 50 hard-earned dollars from my waitressing job on tickets to the Horde Festival, where Primus was headlining. I would never have gone on my own, but knowing his love of Les Claypool and my love of bass players at this point, it was an obvious choice. He was psyched, and we went together, and I'll never forget the distinctive thickness of Les, Clay Les Claypool's bass lines echoing across the humid summer sky. We went to separate universities two hours apart. He studied jazz and music theory in college and passed along his learned info to me. We would hang around on freezing, snowing winter evenings listening to Miles Davis and John Coltrane and Charles Mingus. Kinda Blue, Bitches Brew, and A Love Supreme often carried us into long nights of sex and passion and professions of love in his tiny twin bed. We frequented Medeski, Martin, and Wood shows from Hartford to Boston to Lupo's Heartbreak Hotel in Providence. Despite my broadened musical horizons, I still had a yearning for his approval of my affinity for the Dave Matthews Band. Finally, after dragging him to yet another Dave Matthews Band show, where we sat behind the drummer who broke one stick after another during their performance, he expressed his approval by admitting that, yes, the guy was a pretty sick drummer. I'm often told, wow, you really listen to a wide range of music. A huge reason for this is the first love that conquered me between high school and college. I was exposed to music I formerly thought of as noise sounds I'd not recognized nor chosen to, a whole new awareness of melody and harmony and consonance and dissonance that entranced my brain and never let go. I let go of that relationship seven years later, but those first two years of innocent adoration and pure friendship punctuated throughout by music is the best thing I gained from this former love. When I hear an unmistakable riff from Pavement's Wowie Zowie, it stirs an otherwise absent 18-year-old soul inside of me. The dissonant guitar chords of Rattled by the Rush and the comforting melody of We Dance bring me back to a time I never in my wildest dreams thought I would want to revisit. It brings me back to the excruciatingly long moments I sat on the velour seat, gazing impatiently out the window of a Peter Pan bus at the ever-changing New England landscape. It was a two-hour, 90-mile journey on the Mass Pike heading west towards Hartford, Connecticut that used to feel so long. I sat anxiously, CD player in my lap, listening to Wowie Zowie, because it was a disc he had let me borrow. It was the most tolerable CD he had in my otherwise naive mus musical brain. And as each weekend bus ride passed, pavement grew on me. It's this haunting and hauntingly familiar intro to a tune like Pavement's Grounded that to this day moves me and brings me back to that intense first love, the feeling that enveloped me, the feelings that showered unabashedly over both of us, the feeling I've yearned for and wondered if he has as well ever since. For all things Musical Yearbook, check out themusicalyearbook.com. If you really like this podcast, subscribe to it right now. Do it. It'd be fantastic. And you'll get all the new episodes right away. Musical Yearbook is produced by BAM TV. Check out BAM.TV for hundreds of videos by incredible indie artists. We have episodic content on there. We have documentary shorts. And as always, just head over to Facebook and type in BAM TV and follow. Have a good one.